Can you see it? Is it okay? Okay. Um, so my topic is the ground of the sign. And uh, not to abuse you with metaphors from the beginning, but the ground is a very uh, fertile soil for semiotic thinking, I think, has given growth to many important semiotic ideas. And it is also a sort of uh, well-trodden path, I think, a uh, path that will lead us through um, many of the sub-disciplines of semiotics, including biosemiotics, uh, cognitive science, uh, aesthetic theory, uh, artificial intelligence, and even uh, even possibly um, cultural semiotics. Uh, not that we'll be able to cover all these topics in detail, of course. But I would hope, anyway, uh, given the sort of disparate nature of all of our topics, we're focusing on much different things, that uh, the interdisciplinary character of this topic, uh, maybe you will be able to find something for your own research purposes. Um, as you know, for the publication that we're putting together, Kalevi has instructed us to use a fairly strict uh, organizational system. First, covering the history of our concept, in my case, ground. Second, the previous use of the concept in semiotics. And third, redefinition of the concept for semiotics. Our own take on the concept. And then, going through the structure on the topic of ground has led me to develop a series of four or five narrow focused research questions, I guess. Um, proceeding from the first to the last, from the most narrow to the most general. Uh, the first being, <clears throat> uh, does the ground of the sign pertain to versus firstness, secondness, or both? And this question um, has something to do with whether we use versus, whether we use versus early definition from 1867 or his late definition from 1897. The second question being, what is the place of icons in grounded science? What is the validity of the critique of iconism? Um, this critique of iconism being the sort of famous uh, conventionalist argument from Umberto Eco where he says that icons have no actual reality. The third research question being, what is the relation between signs and memes in terms of ground? And this pertains to the connection between signs without ground, signs that lose their ground, and signs that duplicate independently of interpretation. Fourth research question being, uh, what should we call these signs that have lost their grounds, if not memes? So obviously, in order to answer this question, we have to define ground first before we can define a sign that has lost its ground. And the final and most narrow and well, most difficult question that I'm least qualified to talk about would be what is the use of the semiotic definition of ground for the symbol grounding problem in artificial intelligence? So proceeding to the first uh, research task, the history, uh, the history of the topic of ground. I know that the history of ground reaches back further in the past than Charles Peirce, but we can only go so far uh, into the past. So I'm focusing entirely on how Peirce defines the ground regarding the history. And as I said, he does this in two different ways. The first coming from 1867, from the on a new list of categories, and the second coming from Collected Papers 2.2 from 1897. Uh, between which is a 30-year gap in which he makes almost no mention of ground and after which he never again mentions ground. And the difference between the two, to me, pertains to the first research question, that is, does the ground refer to the firstness of the sign or to the secondness of the sign? And in regard to the first definition, um, from a new list, on a new list of categories, first defines the ground as an abstraction and refers strictly to the what he calls the attributes and qualities of the sign vehicle for representation. Such a pure abstraction, reference to which constitutes a quality or a general attribute, uh, may be termed ground. This doesn't directly uh, defend the claim that his first definition suggests that it, uh, this doesn't uh, completely justify the assertion that ground pertains only to firstness. And as Colap Piero and Sonnison will later explain, this first definition is quite vague, 
uh, but I like to make hard and fast divisions for the sake of clarity. A later quote will uh, make it more clear what the first definition implies. Again, the ground is a pure abstraction reference to which constitutes a quality or general attribute. Uh, the main point of this quality or general attribute is that these qualities uh, are independent of their reference to an object. So we're not yet speaking about the ways in which the firstness of assigning these qualities pertain or denote an object. Rather, these are in isolation, in suspension, so there's no signification even happening yet. And the later uh, trichotomy reduced uh, in on a new list of categories makes it a bit clearer that, uh, in the first place, this quality clearly pertains to the represent dominant of the sign. The firstness relation pertains to the secondness, and representation pertains to the thirdness. But as you can see, equality is in reference to a ground. That is, ground refers to the firstness of the sign distinctly for the early definition of the sign, of the ground of the sign. The second definition is where it begins to become clearer that the ground has something to do with the secondness of the sign, the object dimension, especially insofar as the qualities and attributes of the represent common denote the object either iconically, indexically, or arguably symbolically, although that's problematic. So, this comes from perhaps the most quoted passage from Peirce, as far as the definition of the sign is concerned, one which most of us, I hope, have read before. A sign or representation is something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. It addresses somebody, that is, creates in the mind of that person an equivalent sign, or perhaps a more developed sign. Uh, that sign which it creates, I call the interpretant of this first sign. But more importantly, the second part, this sign stands for something, its object. It stands for that object not in all respects, but in reference to a sort of idea, which I have sometimes called the ground of the representant. So these qualities and attributes attributes which the ground depends upon are not sufficient, they're necessary but insufficient um, qualifications for establishing the ground of the sign. They require an aspect of secondness, that is, they require the participation of the object dimension. Goran uh, Sonnison, um, in his paper on Iconism makes this quite clear. But uh, Colatiero, uh, in quoting T.L. Short, points out the fact that, and reminds us that after 1897, Hearst um, drops the use of ground entirely. And Short even um, proposes that maybe we should not even use the concept of ground to describe the motivation of the sign. And so here, uh, Colatiero says, since for first reflection on the relation of a sign to its object yielded the trichotomy of icon, index, and symbol, Short's hypothesis implies that what Peirce initially tried to capture with the notion of ground, he eventually endeavored to embrace with his classification of icon, index, and symbol. So in other words, what was initially simply called the ground, Peirce <coughs> developed um, after the turn of the century and specified into this trichotomy where the qualities and attributes of the representation relate to the object specifically, either iconically, indexically, or symbolically. And there, but there's a problem with this, and I disagree with T.L. Short, and I believe that uh, Galapi Ektar seems to disagree with Short as well in, in uh, several ways. Uh, the main one being that um, there are types of signs designated by the object dimension which arguably do not have ground. And these types of signs that lack ground are my main focus of the presentation. And they are always symbols. So you see the, the difficulty. We can talk about a sign and its relation to its object in terms of symbols, but if we do not have the distinguishing characteristic of ground, we cannot talk about how the object relation can either possess ground or lack ground. And so and this, I disagree with uh, this short on the idea that we need to abandon the idea of ground. I think that 
idea of ground is crucial to the description of the sign. And uh, so Sonneson uh, has a very important paper on this topic, on the, um, which discusses the issue of ground in several areas. And he seems to agree on the topic that the ground pertains specifically to the secondness of the sign, that is, to the object dimension rather than strictly to the representation dimension. Uh, the topic for the, the title of the paper is Iconicity Strikes Back, or Why Echo is Still Wrong. And the quote is Given the preliminaries, it might be said that an indexical ground or an indexicality involves two things that are apt to enter in the parts of the expression and content or representation and object into a semiotic relation forming an indexical sign. If iconicity is a firstness but the ground is a relation, then the only solution, it seems to me, is to admit that, contrary to indexicality, iconicity is not in itself a ground. So two observations about this quote and the paper. Uh, the first being that uh, secondness does not only refer to the, um, the construction of the sign as a whole, that is, to the object dimension. Also, secondness pertains to uh, the second term in each trichotomy. So instead of the firstness quali sign, it refers to sin sign. And the secondness of the object dimension, obviously, too, is an index, not an icon, which would be firstness. So an important question arises then. If the ground of the sign pertains to the secondness, then does it pertain to the index as well, rather than to the icon? Uh, clearly. Sonneson believes this is true. But he may state it a bit too strongly because, as is obvious or should be obvious, uh, indexicality cannot happen without iconicity. Without the attributes and qualities of the sign, indexes can't happen. And so to say that the ground does not pertain whatsoever to iconicity is a bit too extreme. But more than that, uh, the topic of the paper is not specifically ground. Uh, the topic of the paper is the reality of icons and the criticism, the critique of, uh, of Umberto Eco's rather famous, infamous, but subsequently redacted uh, critique of iconism um, as a convention. And I'm sure you guys already uh, know this, or probably, but just to summarize Eco's critique of iconism, the idea is that in any given sign relation, let's say, uh, like a reference to a book or to a, a water bottle, um, as far as attributes and qualities, there's a wide variety, a um, large but finite number of possible uh, features that we can select. Uh, and which ones we select is a matter of choice. The basis upon which and which one, uh, which one do we prioritize? Which feature of the object is going to determine that it has a similarity relation to its sign? Uh, his argument is that these are uh, culturally dependent uh, choices, and that therefore uh, similarities, these similarities are uh, merely effects of convention, that is, of culture. And that, in summary, icons have no reality independent of this symbolic function. Icons are merely a function of symbolic uh, conventional systems. Now, Sonneson's critique, or his rebuttal of Echo's critique of iconism, is rather persuasive and fun to read. Uh, however, uh, what I find rather peculiar is that, uh, well, this was written in 2010, as you can see, but the rebuttal of uh, the critique of iconism was most thoroughly and persuasively developed by Sternfeld three years prior to that, and these two know each other, right? They work together. And yet, in Sonneson's paper, in the list of references, there is no reference whatsoever to Sternfeld, which kind of blows my mind. Because I'll do respect to Sonneson's work. Uh, Frederick's is far more persuasive, I would say, and thorough. And so, as you can see in the third chapter, how to learn more. An apology for a strong concept of iconicity. Uh, he lays this out very, very, very carefully. Not only does he rebut Echo's critique of iconicity, but he also rebuts 
the post-structural critique of iconicity, the analytic philosophical critique of iconicity, as well as Goodman's critique of iconicity, is very thorough. And so, yeah, rather peculiar. Although I'll tell you that it reads, uh, it doesn't quite read like an apology. <laughs> it reads a bit more like an attack on this uh, crude argument that overlooks the fact that similarity is culture dependent does not make a mere effect of cultural norms. So to say that similarity is relative, variable, culture dependent, merely amounts to saying that any particular judgment of similarity is dependent on the classes of similarities envisaged, which is a mere truism, more apt, in fact, to dissolve the concept of culture than the concept of similarity. So, my topic is not the reality of icons so much as it is the concept of ground and loss of ground, but I'm sure you can understand how defending the existence of ground, if ground depends upon this relation between a representant and an object, depends upon the defense of the idea that icons and indices, or in other words, sub-symbolic sign types, have reality, that they're not mere effects of symbols or products of, of cultural convention. So the, one of the claims, the important claim from Sonnison's paper is that the definition of the ground cannot be exhausted by reference to iconicity or firstness, but depends upon secondness and indexicality. And the best example of this, maybe, and maybe it will help clarify it to you, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this jargon that I'm using, uh, the best example of the way that ground depends upon secondness and indexicality comes from biological anthropologist uh, Terence Deacon, uh, specifically from his book, uh, Symbolic Species. He's uh, got his degree from Harvard, taught at Harvard for eight years, works in Berkeley right now, in the anthropology department. In any case, for those of you who haven't read it, um, the basis of the book is that, um, first of all, verbal language, human verbal language, is the first evolutionary threshold where symbols occur in biological usage. But second, that uh, in symbolic language, reference in general, but in symbolic language, there's a sort of uh, a referential hierarchy which this nifty, very nifty diagram um, shows. And this hierarchy consists, at the ground level for him, consists of token object relations, such as bottle or computer. You can see how these are like on indices. Yes, they're not really symbols. This is not really symbol usage yet for Deacon. And these token object relations, relations form the sort of first level of the representational hierarchy, and after which uh, relations between these, uh, you know, tokens for objects of reference uh, develop like semantic networks here and between each other. And this is still sub-symbolic for him. But after which, and what is unique to verbal language, symbol use in verbal language is that at a certain level, these new networks and syntax comes into play. Uh, upload, if you will, these indices such that verbal language no longer depends upon these uh, token object or indexical relations. In other words, what makes verbal language work, uh, what, gives it, what gives it its higher processing power than other forms of signification, is exactly the loss of ground. <coughs> yes. And ground in this case being, second, this being indexical token object relations. And as he says it, the indexical token object relations upon which the structure was built are subordinated to the now dominant token-token system of the symbol. And he uses other words to ascending the representational hierarchy. Progressively frees responses from stimulus-driven immediacy thus creating space for the generation and consideration of alternatives. So, Deacon uses a fairly, fairly simplified uh, model of Charles First in order to describe uh, 
the model of first semiosis in order to describe verbal language and how it happens. Uh, but he's actually been pretty widely criticized in the last 10 years, especially by Persian scholars, uh, due to this rapid development of first studies and rapid complexification of first studies, on the grounds that mainly that his, his model is too simple. And uh, I'm not going to disagree uh, with them on this topic. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I love the book. Not so much because of the sophistication of his application of first, or uh, because I think his Persian model is sufficient, uh, or because he's a, a famous scholar who also endorses semiotics, which is a big selling point for me, uh, but mainly because of the conclusions he draws after the fact. Not about how language is acquired, but this, uh, this observation that with the, deta the detachment from ground, but the detachment from ground, while it provides evolutionary advantages, higher processing power and so on, uh, equally and at the same time uh, provides this uh, disadvantage, or maybe a danger, begins to speak of almost nefarious potential of these kinds of signs that lose their ground uh, due to the reproducibility of them. He even gets a bit hyperbolic. Uh, he says, Verbal language use and other symbols provides a reduction in the relative differences in associative salience by virtue of the partial dissociability of symbolic reference from the more direct associations with other correlates and features of its object. Thus, prepotent and arousal influences are reduced. So, to clarify, these prepotent and arousal influences are these uh, preconceptualized percepts, or you could call them the grounds of design, iconic and or indexical associations, pre-symbolic. So for some reason, this symbolic reference diminishes our perception of these. And, and for Deakin, this poses a problem. And here, this is when he gets a bit uh, more hyperbolic, calling this uh, after effect of symbolic references broader cognitive penumbra, extending beyond the increased intelligence or language ability cast by our neural evolution. And then he even goes as far as to say that it is like a mind virus. We have become the means by which it unceremoniously propagates itself throughout the world. <laughs> and so, the thing is, uh, his use of first doesn't justify this at all. Nowhere in his use of first is it evident that there's a connection between symbol, symbol use, loss of ground, and reproduction, reproducibility. And this is exactly my claim, is that if we use a more sophisticated model of first, we can show, using Percy and logic, that it is quite so. And that's what I would like to demonstrate. Uh, this is where my sort of contribution comes in. And we can move from the previous use and history of the concept to the redefinition of the concept. So everyone's familiar with this. Anyone who's seen me present before is probably quite sick of this diagram. Anyway, it's uh, it's a depiction created by H.G. Uh, Hoffman of the sign relations as they're described in the 1903 syllabus that first wrote. And, uh, this is from 1903, but as you know, later on between 1906 and 1908, the system was enlarged such that the combinations yield more than 10 types. And part of this enlargement had to do with the introduction of new trichotomies, such as this trichotomy of the interpreton. may or may not know, uh, the immediate interpretant is the incomplete or unrealized response to the immediate object. The dynamic interpretant is the response to the object in a certain point in the chain of semiosis. And the final interpretant is this idealized ultimate response which exists at the frontier or the limit case, the end of inquiry, so to speak, or sort of the chain of semiosis ends in the same kind of pertains to the immediate and dynamic object, where the immediate object is the object insofar as it is presented by the representant or the sun. A dynamic object is a sort of idealized object as it actually exists for the group of inquirers, but there's no final object. Why is this? Well, the dogmatic response, the dogmatic answer to why there is no final object is because, well, the interpretant is a thirdness, the object is a secondness, and the sign is a firstness. Therefore, as you can see, the sign only has, or the representant only has one immediate representant, 
no dynamic, no final. Therefore, the object has two, the interpret on has three. But that doesn't really explain anything, does it? Now, this is part of my original speculation, but I argue that the reason why there is no final object is because in the event of the arrival of the final object, and this would be just like the final interpretant, an object which exists at the limit case after which there is no further inquiry into the object. There is no further reference to an object. My argument is that in this case, uh, the object dimension collapses entirely, and the object and interpretant become one. That is, no more, no more need for reference to an object, because a concrete habit of a step, a concrete habit of action has been established. Yes? This frees the sign relation from the context dependency of the object. And this is what potentiates its infinite reproduction independent of interpretation. Yes, the chain of semiosis ends, translation ends, but copying takes over. And I'm not the first person that's made this observation, of course. A colleague who wrote this Oh, 15 years ago. A meme is a sign without its triadic nature, i.e. a meme is a degenerate sign in which only its ability of being copied remains accordingly. The object of copying are memes, whereas the objects of translation are signs. But this leads me to the second part of my redefinition, is that what do we call these things? What do we call signs that have lost their ground and become uh, replicators? and that require no interpretation. I would say we should avoid calling them memes, if for no better reason that we don't necessarily want to associate ourselves with or incur the abundant wrath of Richard Dawkins. But I also think that calling them degenerate signs doesn't really work, because in Peirce, as, as Peirce actually wrote about degenerate signs, uh, degenerate signs are not, in fact, a symbolic sign which loses its ground, but rather Degenerate signs are any sub-symbolic sign at all. So like any index icon or any other sub-tertiary sign which does not involve which does not involve thirdness of arguments, symbols, or legend signs. Yes. So a degenerate sign is taken and we don't want a confusion. We want an ethics of terminology. To be more conservative than that. So I have various suggestions. <coughs> this is really complicated and I don't want to I got to the end of the hour. Yeah. Um, what we know, according to Percy's system, is that these symbols that the only symbols that can lose their ground are symbolic symbolic legend signs. All symbols are legend signs, but it's important to specify uh, symbolic legend signs. And we know this because it's already in accordance with the observations that Percy and others have made about the character of legend signs, specifically symbolic legend signs. That the rules for indexical or iconic legend signs refer interpreters to indexical or iconic grounds, whereas the rules for symbolic legend signs are themselves grounds of significance. And uh, as I mentioned with the previous slide, uh, these new trichotomies, immediate, dynamic, and final trichotomy, uh, sort of fractures the typology of signs into greater and greater numbers. And I argue, though I have not done the sufficient research to prove uh, that uh, it is possible to use these more sophisticated uh, developments of the 66 types of signs to specify just which, just which kinds of symbolic legend signs are the ones that completely lose their ground and turn into what we might call ungrounded signs, unhinged signs, untethered signs, memes, and so forth. You can see uh, up here. So there's 20 legend signs and six uh, symbolic legend signs. So I mean, which I don't know which one. Okay. Maybe maybe just these ones, as you can see, they're the ultimate thirdness. Yes, I know they're not these ones because there's abduction here, and that means there's creativity and translation, which is precluded by the dyadic collapse of the sign. There's also this issue of replicas, but let's not talk about that. What else might be like, might we call them besides symbolic legend signs? As we all know, Peirce's terms are a bit clunky, and I'd rather come up with something with a bit more, you know, appeal. Uh, I thought of this, the hypertrophy sign, but we discussed it, and I guess the etymology of the word is incorrect because it involves eating. It also means the expanded growth, excessive development of an organ or part, uh, whereas the, symbol, or the uh, sign without ground is the sign 
which loses its foundation and specifically is isolated or disconnected from the chain of semiosis. So I thought of unhinged, because as you can see, it means to separate, disconnect. But more than that, because um, in British slang, it, it means something more. It means to be like crazy or batty, and sort of like Terence Deacon's observation of the effect of these ungrounded signs is that they can create a pathological relationship to the environment. Can might kind of take control of your mind and make you crazy. And so I, I rather like the urban dictionary definition of unhinged kind of works too. Crazy, psychotic, confused, basket case. Nice example too. Um, so, nearing the conclusion. And this is a complicated part. Symbol grounding problem originates from Searle, who issued a challenge to the sort of computationalist model of mind, which would say that there is no difference between computation and, say, biological intelligence. They say human intelligence, but no, that doesn't matter. And the question is, or the, the claim is, at least according to Steele's treatment of Searle, is that where computers can deal with uh, symbol systems and they can process information using semantic networks. What they can't do is ground, creatively ground those networks. Uh, Context-specific grounding, and this creativity aspect. Well, actually, what he, he doesn't say that, that's, that they can't do that. He says that that's the challenge that's being posed. That's the difference between biological intelligence and computer intelligence or robotic intelligence at the moment. In fact, Steele's conclusion, and he's, he works in robotics and so on, and it's very recent as you can see, his conclusion is that it's been solved, it's done, and that the answer has to do everything with uh, embodiment and the ability for the, the robot, in this case, to have a sort of thick enough interface with its environment. But what's, what's interesting here, uh, I think, is that both Steele's and obviously Quarrels, but interesting that Steele's uh, really depends upon semiotic terminology, and he says we must start with purse in order to understand how to overcome the symbol grounding problem and to maintain this anti-computationalist model of mind. My only claim, my final claim, is simply that uh, in order to uh, persuasively defend Terence Deacon and Luke Steele's and whoever else's use of semiotics to distinguish between computation, uh, computation and biological intelligence, we need a more sophisticated person to model. It's just from the very, very get-go. Symbolism. There are symbols that do and symbols do not, that do not have ground. Uh, but as to the uh, third research question, we should avoid using the term degenerate. We should avoid using the word memes. We should avoid hypertrophy signs. We can, of course, simply say these are signs that don't have ground, but it's nice to have a catchier word. Unhinged is nice. Uh, untethered could work, like a balloon that's tethered to the ground and loses its ground and floats away and replicates, if you will. Good work. Uh, third research question about the place of items. Icons are crucial to the substructure of grounded science, but do not constitute the ground itself, which requires indices. And the narrowest and most easily defended claim of the presentation is in conformity with Persis 1897 definition and in agreement with Sonnison, that ground pertains to seconds specifically. Good. Couple of questions.